I'm Jason Bruner and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Historical, Philosophical and Religious Studies at ASU and I'm here with Volker Benkert who's also an assistant professor in the same school at ASU and for the last few years we've been working together on a collaborative project on comparative genocide and one of the questions that really got us into this project was along the lines of how do we talk about comparing genocides without creating some kind of hierarchy of suffering between the genocides? Uh, this isn't just a kind of theoretical question, but it's also very much a practical question, and it's a question that I think researchers should be mindful of. Uh, for example, in 1993 and 1994, uh, when the U.S. was measuring its options with respect to Rwanda, it said, well, there are no concentration camps. It doesn't look like the Holocaust, and therefore it's probably not genocide and we shouldn't intervene. So this has very kind of practical outcomes, this question of hierarchy of suffering in the study of genocide. Um, can you speak just a little bit about the Holocaust's role in this? And how does the uniqueness of the Holocaust um, create some kind of effect in the study of genocide? The rich scholarship of the Holocaust has, of course, contributed largely to the field of genocide studies. Uh, its me methods, um, its uh, vast literature, uh, and of course it also has an, had an impact on the uh, definition of genocide as it is uh, purported by the United Nations that speaks to the intent of uh, the perpetrators. However, it has also been problematic. Um, many um, scholars posit that uh, the uh, Holocaust was a unique event, uh, and they base their argument on you know, three um, important points. Uh, the first point is on the kind of uh, magnitude of the event, the, the amount of uh, victims it claimed, um, and, and surely uh, this is staggering and, and, and uh, breathtaking. Um, and the second argument is um, about the kind of modernity of the event. Here, these scholars would argue that uh, the existence of concentration camps as these industrial sites of mass murder uh, is an outbirth of kind of Western uh, modernity and its kind of rational planning, its um, um, scientific kind of or pseudoscience that is behind uh, this and its efficiency in organizing mass murder speaks to a form of Western modernity uh, that um, uh, is a, a kind of an outgrowth of enlightenment. Uh, the third point that uh, scholars in, in this um, um, uh, argument make is the particular zeal of uh, the Nazis to murder each and every Jewish person uh, in Europe. Now, let me play the devil's advocate here and let me refute these arguments to a certain degree. Uh, the first argument on the sheer size of, of, of the event, yes, uh, six million Jews were murdered by the Nazi Germany as well as many millions of other people. However, if we compare that, for example, to the murder and displacement of Native Americans in this country, we might come to an argument that even more people albeit over a longer period of time, no doubt, but even more people were, were impacted. Um, secondly, if we take the argument about the modernity, here we can ask that even in the Holocaust itself, um, many victims were not murdered in concentration camps, but uh, died due to starvation in the ghettos, were shot by the Ar Einsatzgruppen in a very archaic manner, um, or um, uh, uh, were worked to death in uh, the many, many, many labor camps that uh, were stretched all over uh, Europe. Um, but what is more, I think is somewhat problematic to think about this in terms of Western modernity. Many of these genocides happened uh, outside of the West um, and, and not impacted by them. So if there's problems with this um, idea of the uniqueness of, of uh, the Holocaust, then I think what is also problematic is that this, particularly the last point on this kind of zeal of the perpetrators, seems to focus very much on the perpetrators and not on the victims, on their actions rather than on those who uh, were impacted by these actions. But on, on that last point of on the zeal of the perpetrators to commit as much murder as they possibly can mm -hmm. of these designated groups, could you speak a little bit more about the implications of that for how the concept of genocide comes to be formulated? 
Yeah. So what, what we are suggesting is that we move a little bit away from this uh, notion of intent that looms very large over the UN uh, Genocide Convention. Uh, and clearly in terms of the Holocaust, uh, we can show the intent of the Nazis to murder each and every Jewish person in Europe. However, even there, there's an evolution, right? In the 1930s, uh, the Nazis did not speak about um, the murder of all Jewish people in Europe, even though they were already engaging in murder on a pretty large scale. Um, so, so the intent here, even for the Nazi case, is something that evolved over time. In other cases, this is much more difficult to establish. So, for example, if we go back to the murder and displacement of native peoples in North America, we can, for example, say that on the frontier there is uh, gen genocidal activities and certainly genocidal language, whereas in Washington that language is much less present and the intent to murder Native Americans surely is very difficult to establish when it comes to, to Washington. So here we seem to have um, you know, different uh, ideas about genocide and intent uh, coinciding at the same time. So if intent is difficult to establish, then we would more um, try to focus on the experience and emotions of, of uh, victims and therefore on the outcomes of these policies than rather on the intent of the perpetrators. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really key distinction to make between intent and outcomes because mm -hmm. you begin to look for different things as a yeah. scholar. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, if you were to shift away from trying to establish intent uh, for the sake of prosecuting, mm -hmm. say, the crime of genocide, then what are, what are you primarily going to be looking at? you'll probably be looking at something like survivor testimonies mm -hmm. uh, to get some sense of the victim's perspectives uh, as well as the survivor's perspectives. And so if you, if you shift away from mm -hmm. the, the intent of perpetrators towards the experience of survivors, then you're, you're looking at different kind mm -hmm. of source materials. And but maybe I can interrupt here. So what is it that we learn from the survivor testimony that comes to us from very different events of, at different times and different continents? Right. Like you said, you can include d different kinds of things. Uh, for example, you're including s maybe documents mm -hmm. and evidence from the American West in the, in the case of Native Americans alongside a Holocaust survivor or the survivor from Rwanda. These are things that are geographically quite dispersed. They're dispersed in terms of nationality, of religious mm. background, and culture. So in some sense, you're expanding the, the scope of what you're looking at as a researcher uh, if you're looking for the experience of survivors and amidst these atrocities and instances of genocide. Um, in looking at many of these from mm. those three uh, uh, instances specifically, what I'm struck with is the, the remarkable amount of continuity uh, mm. and thematic continuity in particular uh, among that, that are usually a part of the descriptions mm. of surviving or experiencing some kind of mass atrocity. Things like ostracism, persecution, of course physical violence, mm. as well as different kinds of practices of memorialization, of mm. thinking about the past, reflecting upon it, recounting it for future generations, the kind of moral exercises that go along with that. Those tend to be present, again, more or less regardless of cultural, national, or religious background. So you begin to look at different things that bind these experiences together rather than simply the intent of someone else to do harm or to murder uh, these particular people. Um, so I think what this does analytically for researchers is that it, it creates a different kind of research paradigm. You're looking for different things because you're looking at different mm -hmm. things. And I think this kind of shift in paradigm could also perhaps move us away from uh, an approach to the comparative study of genocide that really does tend to create a hierarchy of suffering among mm -hmm. these different atrocities. Okay, very good. So in our debate, I think um, what, what we want to hold on to is this problem of hierarchies of suffering that come from a sense of a uniqueness of one event over another. Um, and 
Um, much of this then leads to research that is really focused on um, uh, the intent of the murderers rather than the outcomes for uh, the, the victims. And I think here you're suggesting that um, testimony from survivors of various genocides really help us to identify things that are common in them, that their experiences, even though in different cultural contexts and different continents, are very similar and that their emotions that accompany uh, the experience of these events are very similar. And lastly also that their mechanisms of coping with uh, the atrocities that, that they have to endure are also very similar and that from, from that comparison we can come to uh, an understanding of genocide that is not uh, uh, subject to these hierarchies of suffering. Um, and if I can add to that, um, lastly, this is of course an avenue for scholarship for us, but we also think that this is an avenue for education. We want our students to engage genocide as a global phenomenon, not un one event unique over another, but um, that these atrocities are equally horrible and equally condemnable. And so this educational side of our project is pursued by our colleague uh, Lauren Harris, who is spearheading uh, a large outreach program to Mesa high schools, trying to teach genocide comparatively with the help of diverse genocide testimony.